my parents, they had good music in the house. Like my dad was into Simon and Garfunkel. He was into the Doobie Brothers and Bob Dylan and the band. And there was always good music playing in the house. I remember having the Woodstock soundtrack album in the house and they would listen to that all the time. So then some people say, well, then how'd you get into Kiss? But <laughs> Pete Townsend is why I started playing guitar. Um, because I would hear them on that Woodstock record and then eventually saw them on TV at some point in the early 70s and I saw him doing the windmill and I thought that was just as cool as the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And then of course as soon as I started lessons, all I ever wanted my teacher was to like show me how to play songs and teach me how to play pinball wizard and all this kind of stuff. And I didn't want to know about theory and scales and I was constantly on my dad about getting me an electric guitar because a nylon string acoustic, no, who plays nylon string? I don't see anyone on TV playing a guitar like this. So after six months, my guitar teacher told him he's, he's really serious about this. You see that it's not collecting dust in the corner. He's way into it. And so that's when my dad took me to a music shop and, and bought me a, a used 72 Fender Tele Deluxe, coffee table brown with a black pickguard. I wish I still had it. Um, but yeah, I, I couldn't have been more excited. 76, 77, and I'm already, now I'm like way into, you know, Sabbath and Ted Nugent, Cheap Trick, and just Van Halen is, you know, getting into Van Halen, and my world, my, you know, starting to hear all this other music, and July 18th, 1981, first time we ever, me and Danny Looker and a couple other dudes jammed for the first ever time, and I said to Danny, this is the band we've been talking about for two years, we're gonna, this is what we're gonna call Anthrax, which he had actually learned about in biology class. So for like two years, I had been saying to him, man, that's such a great name for a metal band. Eventually me and you are gonna start a band. When your band breaks up, we're gonna start a band called Anthrax. And finally his band broke up and that's what we did. We met Johnny Halloween of 82 at uh, the Headbangers Ball show that he put on with Riot, Anvil and Raven. Early 83 is when we finally gave him a demo that he liked and, uh, and said, I'm starting a label called Megaforce. And, and it was us in Metallica, you know, is who he had signed at the time. So from July 81 to early 83, you know, not even, not even two years. It doesn't sound, sounds like a short amount of time, but back then it seemed like a really long time to get anybody to even pay attention in the least to what we were doing. None of the major labels were gonna touch us or Metallica. They would like go like this and say, get the fuck out of my office when Johnny would play him, you know, our demos. So I can't say that it was, a, it was great in the 80s. It, it, it's the music business. It's, it, it's never been populated by like-minded individuals, meaning the people running the, the businesses aren't your bros in the bands. Most labels were still actually run by record men, people who actually understood music. And the philosophy was you would develop a band over a course of four or five records and then hopefully they would have a gold record. None of these bands made it on their first album or even mostly their second album. It was on a third or fourth record is when most bands started their careers. And then people go back and buy the earlier stuff. You know, it's few and far between when you get, you know, bands that blew up on their first record and never looked back. These like legendary guys that were running labels from the 60s, 70s, 80s, they were all put out to pasture and and the, the uh, accountants took over and that all changed. And then it became like, well, you get one record. And then from one record, you get one single, and which didn't really affect bands like us because we're not, we're not radio anyway. So we never had to worry about that at least. For bands these days, I don't even know how it works if you're on a major. I don't think majors sign rock bands anyway. So uh, I talked to a lot of bands. There's a band called Rival Sons out of Long Beach who are, relatively new, although they're on like their third or fourth album, but they're really starting to make a lot of noise now. And they're a rock band, they're a hard rock band, and they're starting to do really well, and, and people are starting to take notice. And that's all they've ever done is, they've just done what they've wanted to do and waited for the rest of the world to catch up. So I think they're proving that you can be a rock band and still make it these days. I wouldn't know what to tell a kid in a rock or a metal band other than play what you love. and and hopefully that's going to come through. You just go to work every day. That's, that's the way I've always looked at being in a band. I, I don't look at it any differently than anyone who gets up and goes to work every day. This is what I do. Don't get me wrong, I understand I'm playing guitar in a band for a living, and I never lose sight of that, and I never take that for granted, because it's all I ever wanted to do with my life. Sometimes you have bad days, 
Sometimes you have a hard time in life. Everybody does. You just go to work and you get through it. That's, that's always been my attitude towards being in a band. You figure out what's best for your business and what's best for you as a human and, and you make a decision. The book came about because uh, I finally had it in my mind that I could write one. <laughs> for years I got asked to do one and I always said no because I felt like everybody was putting a book out and uh, also I just didn't think I could commit to the work. But then I started doing these talking shows two years ago where I was you know, just basically going out on tour telling stories on stage and seeing how the stories were going over in front of audiences and the fact that I had a lot of these stories all like literally handwritten out, a lot of stories from my past. And uh, um, that's when the light bulb went off and I was like, I think I got a lot of the work done. If I was gonna do a book, I didn't want it to just be a whole bunch of random stories. I wanted it to be all the highs and the lows, but in a narrative form, and, and, uh, and, uh, and I was able to accomplish that. And, and, and that's when I was like, okay, I think I have a book in me. I, I, I have a tale to tell that's different than the other 700 rock books that have come out in the last five years. So after many years of us just putting our heads down and going to work, suddenly in 2011, it seemed like it stopped raining and the sun came out. And, Instead of us pushing the boulder uphill, it started to roll downhill a little bit for us again and picking up steam and, you know, and here it is 2014 and things couldn't be better again for the band. So next year will be 34 years of me being in Anthrax and not many dudes could say that on this planet that they were in a band for that long and counting and doing it on the level we're doing it. You know, it's, um, that's all I've ever wanted to do. So when people say like, would you see like how long uh, you know, do you see yourselves going or this or that? I said, I don't know. Look at Keith Richards, you know. He gets to be in the Rolling Stones. I think he looks at it very similar to the way I look at it. Why wouldn't you want to go do that as long as you can? Unless you're lazy and you just want to go sit on a beach for the rest of your life, but that's not me. I, I love being in a band. Is that good enough?